Yep, I am catching some Pokemon. Yeah, you know, Pokemon Go is crazy. Millions of people play this game, and it scales like that. Did you know that it was built on Google Cloud? Well, let's talk to technical manager at Niantic Labs to take a behind-the-scenes look at Pokemon Go's architecture and how it scales for a large number of players. Hi, James. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Well, for those who may not be familiar with Pokemon Go, let's quickly go over what it is. So, Pokemon Go is not your typical mobile game. It's a game that involves walking around, catching these little creatures around you called Pokemon that are appearing in the real world. It encourages you to go outside, explore, and discover things using augmented reality. A big part of that, which wasn't included in the game when it first came out, was this big community aspect of it. Um, players would go out and meet with other players in real life, they would play play together, battle in gyms, and even like point it out when there was this rare, powerful Pokemon that would appear somewhere in in your in your uh, map. Uh, everyone sees the same Pokemon, so you even see this in like YouTube clips out there. But uh, sometimes somebody would just yell out, "Hey, there's a Charizard here!" and you would see crowds of Pokemon running towards that direction. <laughs> So nowadays, we, we, we really like this part of the game, so we, we made it a major part by hosting regular live events such as community days, raid hours, team go rocket takeovers, it all culminates in this big summer event that we call GoFest. So it's clear that lots of people are playing at any given time, especially during GoFest. How does Pokemon Go back and actually scale to handle these peaks in traffic? So we use Google Cloud. <laughs> uh, we have lots of services that, that need scaling, such as the Google Kubernetes engine and Spanner. Our front end service is hosted on GKE, and it's pretty easy to scale the nodes there. Google Cloud provides us with all the tools we need to manage the Kubernetes cluster. The, the Cloud Console is just really easy to use and comes with detailed monitoring, graphs, tools, logging, all included, and it's just a few clicks away. In the past uh, GoFest, we had Google engineers virtually sitting with us side by side and ready to tackle any issues that could come from, from the event. Uh, it was like having an extra support team working directly for us. To give an idea of scale, we have about 5,000 Spanner nodes handling the traffic and thousands of Kubernetes nodes running just for the Pokemon Go service. We also have the various uh, microservices that host um, other parts of the game that help augment the game experience. All of these work together to support millions of players playing the game all across the world at any given moment. And if you compare ourselves to like maybe World of Warcraft, you'll see that other massively multiplayer online games, they 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 split players into multiple realms. But for us, all of our players, they they reside in a single realm. It was important for us that they players can always interact with each other and share the same game experience no matter where or when they're playing. Yeah, it's like making sure it's one same world and one same similar view that, that you're sharing with all the players, which is what makes the game so amazing. Um, you mentioned Spanner and GKE. Was it always Spanner and GKE, or did you decide to make that architectural decision as the game got popular? So we actually started off with Google Data Store. It was an easy way for us to just get started without having to worry about another piece of infrastructure that we needed to manage and scale and, and deal with all those things. Um, however, as the game matured, we decided that we needed more control over the size and the scale and performance of the database. So um, when we're looking at different um, providers, we saw that Spanner um, has con consistent indexing that allows us to do more complex database schemas with these primary and secondary keys. Data store was also non-relational with atomic and durable transactions. So we needed a relational database with full consistency and made the choice to go to Spanner, which gave us these global asset transactions. 
Well, it's great to see that you started off with a single backend that worked at the time and then quickly evolved that architecture uh, to include the components um, that made more sense as the game grew. Now, let's say I'm a player and I'm playing the game right now. I open my app to catch a Pokemon. What is happening behind the scenes? How does the request flow work? When the user catches a Pokemon, we receive that request through the Google Cloud Load Balancer. All of the static media is also stored on Google Cloud storage buckets and is downloaded to the, uh, to the phone when you first start the app. We also have caching enabled at the load balancer. So it's all cached and served through Google Cloud CDN. So when the, po when the player catches the, the Pokemon, the GCLB sends the request to our GKE cluster. And we have a front end service that sits behind a Nginx reverse proxy. The request goes from the user's phone to the reverse proxy to, to one of these player front end services. We also have this thing called a spatial query backend. It's a cache by location. So that is where we store the information that determines where a Pokemon is shown on the map, what gyms and Pokestops are around you, what time zone you're in, or any other feature that is location based. The way I like to think about it is the front end manages the player and their interaction with the game, while the spatial query back end handles the map. Uh, the front end retrieves the information from the Squibby to send back to the user. So the spatial back end, it sounds like it's a custom database of sorts that presents the map and the Pokemons. Now, what happens when I hunt a Pokemon down and catch it? When you catch a Pokemon, it sends the request to the front end to the Spanner database where your player entity is stored and it's stored there. Um, for catching Pokemon, that actually doesn't go to the, the spatial query back end. Um, if you were instead, if you were battling in a gym or adding lures to the Pokestop, that information is stored on the spatial query back end. And then the data gets eventually consistent, at which point that oh, the player, the players will receive the update, and then it's used for all the other players that are in your vicinity. The, the front end at that point will retrieve the information from the spatial query back end and send it back to the user. We also store this information using Protobuf and write this data into, additionally, we also write this data into Bigtable, um, which we also use for logging and tracking purposes with the, with very strict retention policies. Um, we also use PubSub to send the kind of a, a message to a PubSub topic, which is then used for our anal an analytics pipeline. So how do you ensure that when two people who are in the same geographic regions see the same Pokemon data and keep that relatively in sync, especially during the events? So it's actually pretty interesting. Everything in our servers are deterministic. So even if players are on different machines, um, they're sent to, the, to, to being to different front end services. Um, they all are, if they're in the same physical location, all the inputs would be the same and the same Pokemon would get returned to both users. There's a lot of caching involved and as well as precise timing, especially when the, the settings are changed and they need to be in sync across all the servers. So it's very tricky, but it was very important for us that all the players feel like they're part of this one shared world. Speaking of analytics, we talked a little bit about PubSub and you're sending these messages into PubSub for analytics. Now, there's massive amount of data that must be generated during the game. How does data analytics pipeline work and what are, your, what are you analyzing? Yeah, you're correct. Um, there's like 10 to 20 gigabytes of data that gets generated on a daily basis and stores all of it in, into BigQuery. This, this game data is of interest to our data science team. They use this for, for marketing purposes, for, for verification, for um, like, for example, we might want to say that this player or players caught X millions amount of Pokemon during, during our Saturday uh, community day events. So it's important that we have that information that in an easily accessible manner. We also use Dataflow as our data processing engine to run batch jobs to process the player logs that are sitting in big big table. One example of that is using uh, cheat detection. We might 
look through logs and notice that a player used to be in Japan, and then a minute later, they were in Australia. So we want to check for that and make sure that we're responding to improper, improper player signals. Um, on the other side of things, uh, we also use Google Dataflow to set up Pokestops and gyms and habitat information all over the world. We take in information from various sources, like OpenStreetMap, the US Geological Survey, and Wayfarer, which is our crowdsourced website for players to submit uh, points of interest in, in their neighborhood, and combine all that information to build a living map of the world. Now, as the events grow, like you mentioned, in some of these events, the traffic grows to millions of users per second. You also said 10 to 20 GB of data is generated. How does the system scale when it comes to data pipeline? Yeah, so what, with this increase of transactions, there is increase of load throughout the system with a lot of our uh, data pipelines. For, for things like BigQuery, a lot of that just works. Uh, Google Cloud will, will handle the increase in traffic without any, any intervention. Some of the other things will just scale preemptively and make sure we, we work with Google to, to uh, make sure that we can support that traffic. With that much traffic, obviously, health of the system is critical as well. How do you monitor the health of the system during these massive events? So we use multiple monitoring systems, including Prometheus, Grafana, and Google Cloud Monitoring. On a personal level, I actually prefer to Google Cloud Monitoring because it's very simple to use. Uh, for me, it's very easy to set up graphs, to set up alerts, and um, not have to get really into like the nitty-gritty the nitty gritty details of some of these other implementations. Everything just is very easy to use in Google Cloud and Google Cloud Monitoring. Well, it was awesome to hear the, um, the entire implementation and the architecture details. I am very sure you have something in mind or you're cooking up something to evolve this architecture right now. Um, what are some of the expansions and improvements you're looking to do um, in the future? On the Google Cloud side of things, we are looking into things such as Agonias and Google Game Servers and using that to, to see how we can make our game even better. We wish you and the Niantic team best of luck for these enhancements. And this has obviously been super insightful for us, James. Um, thanks for joining me today and sharing your architecture with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Well, we just took a behind the scenes tour into Pokemon Go's architecture, how they use GKE and Spanner for scaling to those high peaks and how their data science team works with BigQuery, Dataflow, and PubSub for the data analytics. Want to learn more? Check out the links below. Like and subscribe while I catch some more Pokemons.